everyone and welcome to Teach Me Tuesday. Today's episode is sponsored by the lovely people over at Unicorn and we'll chat about them later before we go into some listener questions. I'm your host B-Dub and with me is Ersi. Hello Ersi, how are you? I am doing very well on this uh, fine day. I um. I, I that's all I got. Oh really? Uh, I was gonna. I was actually having a look at your uh, Dota buff before going into a match. Oh yikes! Don't do that. I, I saw that you it's have a, a recent loss on uh, Terra Blade, and I was wondering, did you listen to our uh, Patreon episode all about Terra Blade no. before? <laughs> it's funny. Uh, I played those games in Party with Proud. Oh. We played. I, I played an Invoker game. It was a five stack, but Proud and I were both in it. Um, um, yeah, I played an Invoker game that went great, and I built an E Blade, and it was it was just it was just amazing. Um, and like you know, legitimately, not just like memeing, like it was a really good E Blade. Um, <laughs> and then I played a Terrorblade mid game, and uh, I will I will say I I it was very unfortunate timing because these were right after you guys had recorded your Terrorblade oh. exclusive episode. And obviously, I didn't listen to it because yeah. it did not exist at that point. Um, but so Proud had I had presumably talked for an hour about yes. Terra Blade, and then I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna play it as a mid." And uh, then I skipped Dragonlance, and I just I, I picked the wrong talents according to Proud, and it was just a oh, catastrophe no. all around. Um, well, it actually went fine, but it was a hard game. We just got ratted into oblivion. Right. Was supremely unfun games. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't sound fun. Um, at least you have an excuse so that you hadn't listened to the episode yet. So um, I exactly, have no excuse because yeah. I've just, I just have played. I've just played a terrible game and lost it. Um, <laughs> and that was after recording the episode and everything. And I went into it. I was like, yes, I know all this new stuff. And um, yeah, I, I messed up real, real bad. Um, didn't get my sanders off. Why? Like, do you know why? Like, well, do you know, like, what went we wrong? We had, our, our team was tilting a lot. So it was a, okay, it was a bad, helps. like, right from the start, we had, um, like, a a Slardar last picking in offlane, and um, he he was just mad right from the beginning. He just wasn't, he was just angry and shouting over microphone and typing and in all caps and was just, like, very angry at our, um, our Rubik, who was fine honestly like he just died a bunch of times and blamed it on everyone else so that wasn't a good mentality to go mm. in and then um yeah i had a little bit of a tough lane and they just they had an axe and he just did really well and yeah i could i did i felt like i couldn't do that much about it like yeah i don't know it was it was tough it was a difficult match I'm, I don't think I farmed particularly well. Um, I think it was better, though, than if I we hadn't have gone through that whole episode. Like, if, if I'd just gone in with my mm -hmm. regular knowledge of Terra Blade, it would have been even worse. So, <laughs> I mean, at least there's yeah. that, right? Yeah, but, I suppose there's that. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it, yeah. Was just, it was just very difficult. Um, I forgot that I had a BKB at one point, which called, led me to die, and then I was like, oh. Oh, yikes. Yeah, and I've also, I've changed... Um, I've changed my um, keybinds around, so like, I've changed all my item keys around, so they were all numbers, and now I've actually changed them to letters and stuff. So I'm still kind of getting used to that a little bit, but oh, okay. it's actually not been too bad. Because um, okay, that's good. It takes yeah, a while. Yeah, it takes a little time. I haven't changed mine in a long time, but well, I remember I've changed a few things here and there over the years, um, and it, it does like you. I just expect to like mess things up a solid 10 15 times before yeah. like remembering yeah because i wanted, even i have that with control groups yes yeah, so that's why i've changed it all because i wanted my control groups as the numbers and then because before my items was like one two three four five um and then like my mouse keys but i've changed it to like t g v and c um so yeah t, G, v, and yeah c. as my items and then i've got two Oof. mouse um buttons as well as my last two item keys what can i ask a weird <laughs> yeah. question do you have do you have large hands um like scale wise fairly i think i have quite i've got fairly large hands maybe uh yeah i was just wondering because like that is like an awkward position like because i have like pretty big hands like i have good reach um on my keyboard 
but I and that's like a weird contortion to like use VG and C. I've actually I found it okay. Um, I have quite long Did fingers you use your though. Thumb for them? No, no, my index finger. <laughs> huh. I could use. I'm, okay, I'll I'll take yeah. your word for it. <laughs> I'm like I'm just like staring at my keyboard right now and thinking like in a pinch, how do I use that key? And I'm like, there's not a reality in which I successfully like have my. I don't know. This is. I I urge every <laughs> listener that's not driving a car to. Uh, position their hands on their keyboard as though they're going to be using c v g and also their ultimate i don't know that that's well i guess yeah, everybody just has to find what works for them though that's what's more important yeah. uh, so so if it works for you more power my to ultimate's actually set to f rather than r so oh actually, okay that makes much more it's, sense then. so like okay, my hand is a little sense. bit more angled i guess it's not just q w e r yes. i have q w e f Yes, no, that makes sense now. So what are your, like, other two spell keys? For, like, if you're playing Invoker or somebody that has two additional um, spells. I don't play Invoker. <laughs> well, I know, but, like, uh, other heroes have it. Like, if you play Doom and you pick up... Uh, there's no creep that has two actives, is there? No. If you are playing Io I don't and you need to use Io. DNF... <laughs> do you not play any no. heroes that have six abilities? No, I don't. Keys? No, I don't. Like, like if you... I don't think no I don't I've so I've never had this issue <laughs> and I guess if I had another yeah I'm not sure what I would do then maybe then I have to revisit I'm not sure what I would do but I don't play, I don't think I play anything that has more than five because like if there's anything that has like a fifth one that would just go to R I think so like if I was playing ogre and I got an axe the other stun would be on R uh-huh. then do not use D I use that to select all illusions and myself. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, so I this, feel like you're going <laughs> to hit a point where you're like, man, I need to play Io, and I literally cannot use one of its spells. Yeah. Wait, so how how do you... What's what's your setup then? Whilst we're talking about this, we might as well... How do you have... What's what's your, like, keys setup? My... Mine's pretty standard. I use QWRDF, uh, Q, excuse me, QWERDF for spells, uh, QWER being the main mm-hmm. four, and then D and F being the fifth and sixth. Then I use the tilde button for all units, including the hero. One is only my hero. Two is all units other than the hero. And then I have all the rest. I use like three, four, and five. I usually have individual control groups like... Uh, I don't know who's a good example. Like Naga Siren. If I'm a Naga Siren, Tilde selects absolutely everything. One is only Naga Siren. Two is all illusions, um, except for Naga Siren. Three is only illusions summoned by her summon illusion spell. Four is Manta illusions. Five is illusion rune illusions. Okay. Um, and that's it. So like that's a example of like a complicated hero or like um, right on yeah but i like those hotkeys proud and i were talking about this the other day um i think on a podcast because we have different opinions on on how control groups work where i i rely very heavily on my main tilde as everything one on my hero and two on my everything on my uh, everything other than my hero mm-hmm. c- keys whereas he doesn't use standardized keys like that he has more individual uh individually selected keys yeah um which i i just use my select all units key and then just tab through oh i see okay again like you said it's kind of you know whatever works and then all my all my um i have a razor naga mouse that's old and i don't know how it's still working honestly (laughs) but it has 12 12 buttons on the side and those i have Let's see if I can remember. It's one of those like tactile things, muscle memory things yeah. where like I don't actually know Trying exactly what it. goes where, but I know in the moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I have the my items are one, two, three, four, and six on my mouse. Or no, one, two, three, four, and five on my mouth mouse, and then my space bar. My space bar is always boots. One is always my mobility. Two is usually my secondary mobility or like my secondary most important thing. Mm. Four is another important uh, item slot because those are like the easy ones to reach with my thumb is one, two, and four. Okay. Five is always my TP boots or TP scroll. Space boots, like like I said, are always my boots, whether they're phase or treads or whatever. 
And then three is kind of my, like, I don't want to hit this button accidentally button. Yeah. So that's where I have, like, my BKB and stuff like that. Okay. And then, like, the 10th button is well played. The seventh button is my, I think seventh button is shop. Sixth is courier mm-hmm. or vice versa. Again, like, these are just muscle memory, so I can't, I don't remember off the top yeah. of my head. And then, like, 12 is my chat wheel. 11 is probably something. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, so I, basically all my items are on my mouse, and then all my abilities and control groups are on my keyboard. Mm. I used to use the F row, F1 through 3, 4, for miscellaneous control groups, but I don't like those keys that much. I feel like yeah. I, I switch to a mechanical keyboard, and I feel like I fumble it. It feels too very far away, especially because they have that kind of gap between them as well. It just seems so far. I don't like moving my yes. hand that much because <laughs> then i feel like if i'm then yeah I, I don't know i just if it if i put it in the wrong place and then don't notice then everything's skewed you know um but yeah i don't yeah. actually use the the tilde button for anything i don't have anything That's set great. to that Some people Maybe... don't like using their pinky yeah I, I've, I've just met people like that that are like yeah i don't i don't like use certain fingers of mine in my key, in my hotkeys like as though they have weak fingers they're like oh yeah i like I'm just really bad with my thumb or I'm really bad with my pinky. So I just don't use it for like extra hotkeys. Mm. So yeah, I, f- I feel that like might be a weird limitation. Yeah, I, was, I probably wouldn't use my little finger to push it or even maybe my full thumb. I feel like I would use my middle finger for it. Really? Yeah. You're... Which involves See, you taking like, off yeah. the whole I was moving gonna say, the whole that's a, thing. I don't like, yeah. That's a large movement. It is a big movement. Maybe I could use my fourth finger. I'm not sure. But that might be better to yeah, change, knows? select everything to that, like you have it. And then that frees up the D key. And then if I ever do play anything that has six abilities, then I can actually do that. Yeah. Are you like, yeah, I mean, even if you like accident, like if you're playing, if you're in low prio, as I'm sure you frequently are, uh, you <laughs> are like get random invoker. It's like, all right, like, do you play Invoker without using one of his abilities, or do you at least try to use two? I've never been in low prio. I know, I, I, I was mostly joking, but um, who knows? Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe you like bring out the flames. I, I've not, <laughs> I've, I think I've, I've, maybe I've, no, I've never been in low prio. I, actually, I might have gotten like one game once, because there's mm. been a few times for Theorycraft Thursday that we just have to abandon games to like uh, make our time useful. Yeah. But, like, if we're trying to run a combo and, like, we get, like, two games in a row and, like, we're recording late at night so we don't have time to, like, dick around and just play pubs, uh, we've had to just abandon games. And so I think once I've gotten low proud just from abandoning games due to that. Um, but I, I also, like, I've played many low proud games to get friends out of low prio. Yeah, I've played a couple to, of those. Uh, some success and some failure. Actually, quite, They're fun. I quite, yeah, I was going to say, I quite enjoy low prio. Like, it's kind of random. You're not really sure what you're going to get. And I don't know. I guess it's fun because I'm not actually in it. If yeah, you're stuck like in it, experience. yeah, I was going to say, if you're stuck in low prio, I can imagine it's horrible. But because I just yeah, kind of like, like join and I'm like, oh, look at this fun experience that I can just leave and it'll like, be fine. <laughs> yeah, it's like the novelty of like going on a prison tour. You're like, oh man, this is terrible, and like I'd never want to be here. But then that's fine because like you leave at the end of the tour, right? Um, like, yeah, because I went to I went to Sing Sing, which is a prison in New York that's somewhat famous. Okay, uh, it's it's a very large prison. I went there for a uh, technically it's like a scared straight program. Um, that's how we got in, but I was not like sentenced to a scared straight straight program. I don't know if you guys have those. In I the don't. UK. Yeah, I don't know but what that I, is. It's like it's like if your kid gets caught like uh, like doing graffiti and spray painting, like they're not going to get arrested, but the cops might like order you to go to a prison to see what prison is like, oh. so that like as a to scare your kids straight. Um, and you went like, and you yeah, went to one like, of these. Yeah, well, I was in a criminal law class, and oh, I thought we, you were going to say that you had like, like done something. Like you had been caught. Cool. No, like, no, no, no. I was like, I was gonna say, like, what? No. What did you do? <laughs> the knife factory story led me here. <laughs> Tell um, us the gossip. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but uh, but so I, so we went to like a prison right. and like we met with people that were like nobody was like a murderer, but we had to like I forget what what crimes the guys were, but it, like the the program itself was a scared straight program. Mm. It was just like we were the weird people that were like, yeah, we're just like high schoolers that are going in a criminal law class, um, and it was it was intimidating but fun um in 
and it was just like that because it's like, yeah, we like come in for the day and then we leave and like you have to wear very specific like neutral tones and like I had a wristband on mm. uh, and like I had to tear it off like on the bus ride there because it was blue oh. and like blue is associated with the Crips. So you can't oh. wear that. Otherwise, like you'll get jumped by like a blood that's like in Sing Sing. Um, oh, so not that that would necessarily happen because obviously like you're under like guard from like these prison right. employees. But there's still like, you know the potentials like you have to wear like all like black and gray like sweatpants and stuff and it, it was uh huh. it was a very interesting yeah experience. that's really interesting so yeah sing sing is not a nice place don't go to prison guys that's my professional advice for everybody um yeah. that being said that was very much like the real life version of low priority yeah to bring say. this back to dota <laughs> yeah. so uh yeah don't go to prison and uh, don't go to low prio yeah. Or well, and if you do preferably go there like just for uh to visit a friend. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> go, go on visitation hours. Uh yeah. So that that was a tangent right there. Yeah, if anybody's I, got any questions about how Sing Sing works, hit uh, yeah. me up. We could talk about prison. I'm not even sure what led us there, honestly. I can't even remember. But um We're talking about Lil Prio. Oh yeah. What and I we just talking, wanted to yeah. bring up this experience because it was fun. What were we talking about before that? Anyway. I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, not that it's Hot probably... Keys. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, we should probably go through the uh, patch notes. <laughs> yeah, the 7.09. Yeah. Let's. Uh, so, uh, man, that would have been a much better story if I just didn't explain the background at all and just like, yeah, well, last time I was in prison. Yeah. That would have been funny. <laughs> uh, but I didn't do that at all. I, I agonizingly explained it. Um, anyway, uh, you know... That's that's why we don't tell the knife factory story. We just got to keep it under wraps. And everybody just wonder. Yeah, I still don't okay, know what it is. Okay, so that's fair. It's better if you don't know what it is. Yeah, I think uh, it, also I feel like less... I'd, it would be disappointing if I knew about it now. It's probably been like overhyped or something. Or maybe not. Yeah, Who well, knows? Also, I, I'd, I'd be a bit more culpable for... Oh, I... <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, let's talk about the uh, so, let's talk about the the patch, right? <laughs> so yeah, no cops <laughs> listen to this show. It's fine. <laughs> so uh, new patch is basically support heaven. Yeah, uh, it's basically a bunch of support buffs and a bunch of other stuff that doesn't matter. Uh, not really, actually. It's all support buffs. Mm. That's I'm just rereading it now. There's only what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's only eight eight bullet mm-hmm. points. Yeah, it's all support buffs. So. Courier is 25% of the price that it used to be, which is a yeah. stupid way to describe it. I don't know why I overcomplicate that. It's 50 gold now, the Courier. Yes. Um, which is And so on top cheap. of that, not only is the... Yeah, it's great. It's 50 gold. And then on top of that, as of like whatever half dozen patches ago, it upgrades for free at three minutes. Mm-hmm. So the Courier is 50 gold and that's it now. Compared to like a year ago where you were spending like 150 gold or 350 gold cumulatively on the Courier. Yeah. So that's the big change. It's a, yeah, it's but you have it's yeah. amazing, like yeah, it is heavenly. I've played the nice thing about doing one of these patch note reviews after having you know had let's say I played probably like, probably like a half dozen games on the patch since it came out, mm-hmm. and I've played support in maybe like actually I only played two support games because I've had a lot of weird cues that are awful um, where I'm forced to play one, <laughs> but. I, I've super noticed it. Like, I'm feeling super rich. I, in and like, it makes being poor as a five a choice rather than a, like, burden you're just, like, automatically saddled with. Like, in my mo- in a recent Rubik game, I started the game with, let's see, uh, I, I want to make sure that this is, like, true. Because um, I always say, like, one item wrong. Uh, so I started the game with uh, two sets of tangos two wards i bought the courier and i bought a century and i still had 100 gold and and i bought two clarities oh and i and then i had money left over amazing and i only, i could have bought a second century and i was like this is heaven i can just be poor and it's all like it's all gucci yeah i'm i'm just i'm just thrilled cuz like i used to back when i was first climbing a 5k and i was playing mostly rubik and winter wyvern every game and obviously, there's a different meta game, but every game I would start the game with two obs, two sentries, and courier. And I think that's when obs were still tied together. Um, and it was just great because, like, all right, I'm super poor, but everybody else is stupid wealthy. And that was a really like satisfying way to play and climb because everybody on my team was just immediately set off to a really good like mental start. Because mm-hmm. like my four felt rich because he or she had boots, 
And then everybody else was like, oh man, we have sentries in lane, we have sentries in mid, we have off laner has a ward. So it just like set everybody out to be like good. And so now I can do that again compared to before where it was like, all right, I bought Courier and now I have no money because it's 200 gold. Yeah. Um, and we start with 600 gold now, but I, as a core, it sucks to start with 600 gold, but as a support, you are effectively starting with like way more gold than you used to. Mm -hmm. So it's handy. I love it. I'm super happy with the that aspect of the patch. Yeah, I actually haven't played any support since the patch came out. Um, but I am excited to play it. Like because there's just going to be it's this. hard it's to play it now. So uh, yeah, well, I've like people have just been picking it up and wanting to play support, yeah. and I'm like, okay, it sucks. sure. Like <laughs> I hate it. I'm yeah, because like, I guess like you 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 want to play support. Yeah, I'm. I'm. So I renamed myself in Steam to Five. Oh, I because I was so fed up. I was so mad because I was trying to climb. I was trying to play MMR and like climb and like you know MMR is important. Um, and I lost like three games in a row because I like entered the game and they're just like, "Yeah, you're playing carry." I was like, "I don't want to <laughs> do this. Like, that's not what I signed up to do." Like, I wonder yeah, why um, though. I wonder why this has happened because surely. Everyone who's playing core before, why have people then switched over to I mean, support? I think this is just like my anecdotal, my super anecdotal okay. experience. Because like Proud was saying the opposite. He's like, yeah, I, I have to still have to fight for one mm. in his games. So this is just my my bad luck, I guess. Yeah, but you might have just been really I unlucky. Think support has gotten a lot more fun, and it's a lot more high impact. And people are just better at it in, like, the last few years. A lot of people are still obviously awful at it. But um, it has just gotten to be a more fun role. And you have more money just inherently because of how the game works. And with the new patch, you can play a lot more greedy with your starting items. And you can just do a lot more. And it's... So I understand why a lot more people are playing support. But as a support player, it is frustrating to be like, all right, it used to be that I had to play this role. Now it's like I want to play this role, but other people are competing with me for it. Yeah. Um, the the larger thing I was complaining about on, I think on Twitter, I don't know, I complain in a lot of places these days, <laughs> uh, was that I, um, I want, uh, like, so I'm being forced to play one or mid in my ranked games. And I don't mind playing mid, um, but I... Because I'm pretty confident in it with with certain heroes, and like I, I do okay. But safe lane, I am bad at. Like I've come to that conclusion. There's no like ifs, ands, or buts about it. I'm just not good at playing safe lane at the moment. And occasionally I'll have good games, but I feel like I'm always a bit off compared to when I watch other people play safe mm -hmm. lane. And uh, it's like I know what to do theoretically, but I just like fumble it in practice, and like I don't deal with aggro well and stuff like that. But I can't practice playing carry in unranked because in unranked people are still just picking cores every game. So I either go to ranked where I'm forced to play a role I don't like and I'm not good at and know I'm not good at, or I play unranked and I play the role I'm good at and we win, but I'm not gaining anything because like I'm already good yeah. at Rubik. Like I don't need to get better at Rubik in unranked. Like I need to get better <laughs> at Terrorblade, but I can't pick freaking yeah. Terrorblade. So it's just a mess. I've I've been playing on I've been playing offline in my unranked games because at least mm, that's a role okay. I'm bad at and need to practice. But right, I can actually pick that in unranked. So I don't know. Who it's a are you? Um, I know this is kind of a tangent off uh, the updates, but who are you playing in offline? I'm curious. Uh, offline, I'm playing Pangalier at the moment. I'm practicing him a okay. bit. That's been my yeah. little pet project. I don't think I've won a single game on him. Uh, let me look at my record. Because uh, he can be super annoying. I feel like I've come across him yeah, a bunch recently. I've, and and I, I whenever someone picks him, I'm like, oh, this will be fine. And then I'm like, oh, no, this is actually a real pain. And I can never catch him because he's like doing his sliding away or whatever that ability is called. I don't know what it's called. Swashbuckle. Like full yeah that one way essentially four steps away <laughs> yeah and i yeah i agree with you so in my experience playing four games of pangleer so far i i definitely am annoying but that's about all i accomplish is like i'll get solo okay. kills <laughs> i'll be annoying and i'll like do some useful things but cumulatively as the game goes 
I am lower impact than like a more traditional offlaner, like a Tide or an mm, Underlord or an Enigma or, you know, whoever. It's kind of like playing offlane Enchantress where like I feel effective and I'm annoying, but at the same time, like I don't really do anything like resolutely. It's like, all right, I kind of stun mm. people. All right, I kind of deal good damage. I kind of have CC. I kind of do X, Y, or Z. I am kind of a distraction rather than like, all right, if I'm playing Underlord, like I have wave clear and I have a pseudo CC and I TP people out. Like those are very resolute. Like, all right, I do these three things and that's yeah. it. Whereas Pangolier, it's like, all right, I kind of do a bunch of things. So I've been having a lot of fun on him and that's why he's been my pet project in Unranked. But I mm -hmm. definitely don't feel like I am an absolute nuisance. Like I'm not carrying games as him. I'm kind of just like yeah. a guy who does a lot of damage and, you know, whatever. It's fun, though. So, you know. Yeah, he, he does look super fun. His nerfs hit him pretty hard, which is good and very deserving. But the nerf yeah. to his ult cooldown is... You uh, you definitely feel it. I'll say that much. Mm. He also speaks okay, French, Okay, so... Which is does he actually speak French's voice lines? Yeah, yeah. Or his, is it just like a, oh, not cool. all of them? Not all of them, but uh, he has a good amount of French voice lines that I can't remember off the top of my head. My like, my audio is all messed up in game because I have the Korean audio pack on, but they oh, did not yeah. make new because like they've discontinued like because Doge is not big in Korea, so like I guess they just decided not to invest any more money into it. So there okay. are only voice lines up to a certain point in development, and then all the right. future heroes just have English. And like Arcana, it's so like I see. Juggernaut with the Arcana has an English voice, but if you don't have the Arcana, he speaks Korean. So a new oh, hero like I see. a new hero like Pangolier is all English and French because they just never made a Korean voice pack for him. Yeah. Whereas like Luna is just always speaking Korean in my client. Um, whereas like I believe the Chinese client and the Russian client, since they're popular, they get new voice actors for the new heroes that are added and the new Arcanas. Mm. but the korean one is like yeah we just don't care about that so if you use yeah. it it's like it's like seven it's like probably 90 percent korean but then every once in a while you're like oh okay like this guy's a jugger con so i guess i'm just hearing english all game or right, this guy's yeah. playing, <laughs> playing pangolier so i'm just gonna hear pangolier voices it's only there's yeah. only like five or six heroes that have that but you know it is what it is yeah so so back to 7.09. Yes, <laughs> sorry. Kind of tangent. Tangents. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the next point is tangos now come with three charges and cost 90 gold. It's good. It's weird to get used to, Which, but it's good. Yeah. Uh, How much did they cost before? 110. I can't remember off the top of my head. I think they, they were, were 110. 110. Again, like it's one of those feeling things where Proud would criticize, yeah. but I, I play Dota as a feeling. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I feel like I can buy blank, blank, and blank. Um, they were like maybe they were like 125 before or 120 mm -hmm. um but regardless nowadays the big difference is that your starting items change for uh supports and safe laners in that safe laners yeah. you're gonna be buying two sets of tangos instead of mm. like because you used to be able to buy one set of tangos and then like a stout shield and two branches and a mango and then you'd get a wand at side shop right away and then you'd also buy a, a quelling blade at side shot pretty quickly and that's like your first yeah. two minutes of items on a lot of safe lane uh melee heroes like jug but now you have uh you can't get away with only building one set of tangos because you only get three so you either need to go tango salve which a lot of people don't like uh namingly proud mm -hmm. or you go double tango double tango is cheaper than tango salve which is nice um personally i like salves just because it allows me to have some more aggressive like potential because if i take mm -hmm. a fight and i win that fight and i'm low if i'm using tangos the enemy offlaner is going to be back in the lane probably in like 15 seconds you know yeah. maybe even faster and be a threat to me potentially or like somebody roaming on me um whereas if i have a salve that's all right i kill this guy i'm low health i use my salve bam done and then i'm back yeah. at full health so I it's like uh, personal preference yeah, a lot yeah. of people don't build salves, though, and I got used to not playing with salves because I was doing the frequent, I was only having tangos in lane, but mm -hmm. 
yeah, I think I, I think I have to see the light and just go back to doing double tango or go to doing double tango now that you want six. But I really yeah. like salves. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that like changes up your itemization super early a bit, mm-hmm. uh, which takes is going to take some adjustment. Um, the annoying thing about tango salve is that if you if you wait to pick and you lose even just two gold from the like you know if you lose one second's worth of gold then you suddenly cannot build a wand at the start of the game because you have like you cannot buy two branches and a mango so that is very annoying Uh, Mm -hmm. and i've run into that a number of times but yeah in general the tangos are uh, it's a good change uh initially i was thinking like okay because of this change you're not going to be pooling tangos to your mid your mid's gonna buy a set of three tangos but in reality, of course, mid players, the privileged uh, class that they are, they still get pooled tangos. The support just buys two sets of tangos. Uh, yeah. And, and so the mid still gets pooled tangos, which <laughs> is not the, excuse me, is not the change I hoped for or expected, but it is the change that we have, or rather yeah. lack of change. Uh, yeah, I, d- I think that mentality will, is tough to get rid of, right? Yeah, once it, like, because for a long time that was not the case, and then eventually people just got better at Dota and that became the case, and now it'll never get taken away from them. Like, the mid player yeah. is always going to be like, yo, if I don't get pool tangos, I'm going to report supports or yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah. like, they need it. I'm going to feed down mid if I don't get two tangos oh. right now. And you can yeah. and you can pool them pre-game. So, like, they're even more reinforcing the ability to do that. So, like, I still haven't figured out actually how to do that. Like, I know you can do that, but I don't know how to do it. There's a like, I know I, I can just look it up, I'm sure, somewhere, but there's been a couple of times where I'm just like, because I haven't actually played a huge amount of support recently, but I have wondered in game, I'm like, where is this? So in the strategy phase, once yeah. you once you pick your hero, right, then you go to the strategy screen that has mm-hmm. like, right, buy items. When you have your tangos, if you hover over them, there's a little arrow in the bottom left corner, and also wards are like this. And you click that arrow, oh. and it pulls up a little board that's like, all right, it shows your four allies, and then you can click like a little plus sign, and it gives them whatever you're trying to share. I see. So that's how you okay. do. Yeah, and then it shows on the bottom who has been shared what. Yeah, because uh, I've which seen is super that. Handy. Yeah, that is cool. Because then you're not yeah, going to get like a load of people giving time, and exactly. then they end up with loads, and then everyone's like, "Oh, I could have kept this." <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that that's handy. Um, yeah, it's a good way to like again. I think a very valuable thing in in uh, pub games is, especially in solo queue, is keeping everybody happy from the get go. And so, if this dude picks SF and he was mad because like, oh man, my four didn't pick Clockwork, uh, even though I picked SF, so that means I'm not going to get free souls at the beginning. They might be tilted, mm-hmm. but then they're like, oh man, I got two free tangos already. So maybe that like is going to mellow them out a bit. That's at yeah. least a hope and dream of mine which probably does not actually happen but yeah so going further into the patch uh Mm -hmm. initial bounty runes now give 40 gold to everybody instead of 100 gold to the hero that picks it up so a it's the the kind of rather rather than just talking about the change the effect that the change has had is that mid players unless you're aggroing for rune mids are blocking again that's at least what i've seen because you're guaranteed oh, to get okay. money from runes if you're obviously if your oh, teammates get them. Oh, interesting. Um, oh yeah, that, it makes no sense for them to if everyone's getting a share, then it makes that's so yeah that hasn't been happening in my games, but that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, it's been happening in like fifty percent of my games, but I will say it seems like all the good players that I watch are like, all right, I'm just not going to go to that rune at all. Um, the other big yeah. thing is that people are way more aggressive about aggroing for runes now, it appears. But that's kind of a trend that's been happening in the last few weeks anyway. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to chalk that up entirely to this change. But okay. yeah, potentially now you can start the game with like 160 gold to everybody on your team, which is like amazing. I, in yeah, that, that is good. In that Terrorblade game that I played with the Proud, we literally lost every single rune and the enemy team just had 160 gold on everybody. And I was like, oh, yeah. okay, like this is miserable and I hate it. Like, that's just how it is. Um, yeah, that sucks. It also means, like, each rune is 200 gold. Or no, each rune is 200... Yeah, each rune is 200 gold, effectively, rather than it used to just be 100 gold, because it's giving 40 mm-hmm. to everybody. Um, so it the runes are even more important now. So you, you, are, you benefit a lot from stealing runes. Because, like, especially if you think about... We've talked about this with, like, farming theory... 
and stuff like that. If you think about camps, if you think about any gold resource, whether it's a neutral creep camp or a lane creep camp, um, if you take it away from the enemy, that means not only are you gaining money for your side, but you're taking money from the enemy side. So that's why, like, mm-hmm. an AM that's jungling the enemy jungle is uh, is effectively is having more effect than an AM that is jungling their own jungle. Because rather than if they get 90 gold from a creep camp in their jungle, that's all well and good. But that creep camp was never going to be taken by anybody else, so whatever. But if they take 90 yeah. gold from a creep camp by killing uh, you know, a medium camp in the Radiant jungle and they're playing Dire, that means not only are they creating that 90 gold for themselves, but they're taking away the potential for the enemy team to get 90 gold. So with these bounty runes, if you are uh, stealing the enemy bounty rune, you are netting 200 gold for your team and then also taking away the assumed... 40 gold per person that they thought they were going to get by getting their rune mm-hmm. that they thought was safe. So aggroing yeah. is super effective. Like that's basically like a 400 gold swing if you think about it that way. Um Yeah, that's uh that's pretty good. Yeah. So we'll see like how how that changes because I think like the rules of aggro are going to take some take some time to adapt to this change and they're still adapting to previous changes so maybe nothing will happen and people just like accept that you're each team will get two runes and move on maybe people will always aggro the enemy safe lane rune maybe people will always aggro the enemy off lane rune you know who knows how it's going to progress but it's interesting it makes for a dynamic mm-hmm. first minute uh that's definitely i've noticed that in the last in my game since the patch yeah uh next okay next uh killing neutrals this is worded a little weirdly but basically if you stack a neutral camp and somebody else takes it that is on your team you will get 15 percent of the gold that they get so yeah it is a basically exclusively a support buff um but it's kind of just a quality of life buff for doing something nice it's like it's like how you get like a tax write-off for donating to charity it's like, all right, like you yeah, did a good yeah. thing. So here's here's a little scratch. Um, so, yeah, like yeah, I was playing also makes a great sound, which is very satisfying. It's like in my, oh, I was going to say, I love the sound. Yeah. So like in my Rubik game, I just like was stacking camps for our um, what's it called? Our Templar assassin. And occasionally mm-hmm. like she would just be taking camps and I would just hear like the jingle of coins. And suddenly I gained 40 gold. And yeah, it's not a ton yeah, that's of gold. That's pretty sweet. But it adds up. It's it helps, you know it's the though, difference right? of like yeah. a few wards. So that was super handy. Also, like you get it and it's like right, that's a TP scroll right there. So it's a nice bit of give and take, and you're rewarded mm-hmm. for your work. Even and and it's global too. So you don't have to be an AOE at all. So you just like you could be in the complete opposite side of the map. You'd also be dead, and it just doesn't matter. Like you just get money. So it's super handy. Um, mm. It is a. It's like. When I saw this note, some people were theory crafting. They're like, all right, man, maybe people are just going to play like tons of alchemists and tons of gyrocopter and tons of Luna and just abuse the fact that you can inc- create so much money off of this. In practice, I've not seen that happen. Like, I've seen a bunch of Sven, I've seen a bunch of Luna, but it's not felt any different than like Luna and Sven felt before. So yeah. I'm not going to create i i don't i think it's a bit uh presumptuous to make some grandiose assumptions on how this is going to affect the metagame but those heroes are incrementally better and it's an interesting buff because it 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 buffs a hero like luna and sven by buffing their team if that makes sense yeah and if you are a person that plays those heroes you can more reliably have stacks for you in pub games where like people might forget the stack before, but now the the they have like the extra kick in the pants that are like, right, you should be doing this. Like the game Ice Frog mm-hmm. has has coded it into the game that you're supposed to be creating stacks. Like that's yeah, like there's a now large that part. incentive and stuff. I've actually exactly. I have noticed people are stacking more in games yeah, now, which it's is dope. nice. And yeah, and like it's a really nice, nice it's a nice advantage to heroes that can stack multiple camps at once. So, like, mm-hmm. if you're playing Jakiro, you can stack one camp with an auto attack, then Ice Path to stack another camp, because Ice Path is super long range. Or, like, if you're playing Lina, you can Dragon Slave one camp and hit the other. And then you stack yeah. two camps, and it makes for... It makes those kind of picks a little better. Um, especially, like, a pick Lina as a support. Lina's a pretty greedy support, because she needs an item or two. And it makes it a little more viable, 
Not that I would ever say Lena support is viable at the moment, but it makes it a <laughs> bit more viable. It's closer to being viable um, through virtue of her ability to stack multiple camps and get a bit more farm. Shadow Demon is yeah. another honor- honorable mention on this camp mm. um, where he can stack multiple camps very easily. Uh, you can also, like, Naga Siren support is trending a bit as a four, largely because okay. Meteor Hammer is OP, but also just because she can stack, theoretically, like, five camps at once. Um, right. Not that you actually do that in a real game, because odds are you're not, like, a god, but theoretically <laughs> you can do that. Um, yeah, difficult to pull off, I imagine. Yeah, it's it, there, I've, I've watched videos on it, and, like, it just, it's a lot of, of patrolling and like control group mastery um you can also mm-hmm. even do with shadow demon i think shadow demon you can stack four or five camps at once if you like time everything perfectly because like you can shadow poison one camp and then have that shadow poison popping at the point at which it pulls and then you shadow poison another camp directly and it pulls off of the initial shadow poison hit and then you pull another camp with illusion and then you pull another camp with another illusion, and then you pull the fifth camp yourself. I think wow. that's what you do. And it's one of those things where, like, you can do it in, like, a demo mode lobby. Or not demo mode, but you could do it in, like, a lobby if yeah. you, like, you know, if you try it ten times. It's like shooting trick shots in basketball. It's like mm-hmm. if you sit in, like, a parking, if you sit in a basketball court alone and just shoot from half court for a half an hour, eventually you'll hit a half court shot. But nobody actually does that in a real game because it's just not realistic. Yeah. Um, so that's the same thing with like stacking five camps as Naga. It's like, yeah, theoretically, sure, I guess, but in practice, no. Unlikely for it to actually happen. Yeah. yeah. It's handy though. You can do it with like uh, IO can stack two camps. A lot of heroes can stack two camps. That's what you need to worry about, basically. That's, mm. that's the point I'm trying to make. Don't worry about yeah. stacking 18, 1800 camps with Shadow Demon. Stack two camps with <laughs> Naga or stack two camps with like. Like you can stack camps as Terror Blade and then take them yourself, but yeah. if you take them yourself, you don't get the extra money. So there's no. kind of no point. But you like, I don't know, like if you're playing Invoker and you have a Sven safe lane, you can summon Forge Spirits to stack the Ancients, uh, which is very easy to do if as long as you're thinking about it. And then both your one and your two are benefiting from the Sven taking the Ancient stack. It's like, that's super handy. That's a really ni- neat, uh, neat little buff to those kind of styles of play. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it adds up. It's uh, yeah. It's great. I like it. Uh, so... Okay, so the next change is the, the tier one mid lane towers are a bit closer to the river. Have you really noticed the that change? Um, I haven't it's, particularly noticed, I have to admit. It's a little noticeable. So basically, rather than like, let's see. But I guess I don't um, play mid, so I guess it's yeah, not. I've played that a bunch of mid. To me. Yeah. Yeah, I've played a bunch of mid this uh, since this change, and I will say the only thing that really is different is the the circle of true sight and of tower you know aggro is more evenly displayed uh or is more even on like how it is it's more even on how it is displayed and put out in the lane so like it used to be that if you were coming in from the if you were ganking the dire mid as a bounty hunter Mm -hmm. from the like direction of bottom rune there was yeah. a spot where you could not get through because they had true sight. But now mm-hmm. that the tower has been moved a tiny bit, there's an equal point from the from each side that you can come in through. Oh, so I see. Right. It makes it a bit more logical in the placement, and it makes yeah. you similarly vulnerable from both sides. Um, okay. Compared to like before, where you would just have to accept that you were going to take like two tower hits to get there, and then obviously show mm. yourself. So yeah, now yeah. you have room on both sides to gank from both angles if you're an invis hero or if you're just a hero that doesn't want to get hit by a tower. Um, okay, that seems so like yeah. a fair change then. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's just nice to have symmetry, I guess. Um, but in all in all, there's not any like really huge differences. Um, it's just like a lot of small little things where like mm-hmm. it's one of those changes where you might have a fight and you don't die this time, and you're like, all right, cool, but you're not going to like take a fight differently necessarily just because of this yeah. change, if that makes sense. Yeah. The, same so the thing, next change. Oh, sorry. Well, same thing with this next change. So one uh, yeah, tree I was going to say, 
have you noticed the one spot. tree? Yeah, there's a new rune spot because of it, uh, where which is handy. Wait, Somebody really? pointed that out in our Discord. Um, yeah, there's uh, so if you basically put a ward where this tree used to be, it gives you vision of. I think it gives, oh. goes all the way to the rune, and then it also gives you vision of the high ground uh, in that area of radiant jungle, which is super handy. Oh, That's that the is only really handy. difference that this really makes. And also, okay. like, it opens up that, like, little path a bit, so it's a little harder to block people in. Um, but, yeah, it's super minor. Uh, yeah. And then the last change was range creep attack acquisition range reduced from 800 to 600. This makes it easier to zone people as a support, basically. That's, like, the practical application of this. I will say I've been feeling like some wonky things have been happening with this change, because I've been pulling range creeps like that I would never have pulled before, uh, I feel, okay. when I've been playing supports and zoning. And I don't know if something is bugged or if I'm just, like, going nuts, but it. Yeah. I've, I've had numerous times where I'm, like, playing Ruby, I'm trying to zone somebody, and I'm just, like, I'm pulling creeps from, like, way farther away and way weirder angles where, like, they shouldn't have vision of me, and I know they don't have a ward because I sentried, and yet somehow a range creep finds me. So I'd oh, like, to, maybe this is, I'm not going to say it's bugged, but if it was bugged, I would not be surprised. Um, so I'll just wait yeah, for the just, Reddit post from somebody weird. smarter than me. Um, <laughs> but all in all, it should make, like in theory, it should make zoning offlaners easier. Yeah, which would be really nice because I, I always find that's quite difficult. I yeah, it's zoning quite hard. It uh, also like the big thing about zoning is that you have to play around the creep aggro check rate. So creeps check aggro to see do I have to? Let's see how how best to explain this on the spot. Uh, so creeps have like an internal counter that they scan within uh, a certain range of units of them. In this case, six hundred range now for for range creeps. They basically scan and say, all right, is anybody attacking my core? Uh, and they do that, like, I think it's, like, every, like, second and a half, maybe every two seconds. They do this mm -hmm. scan. So if I'm playing Rubik and I'm trying to zone a Beastmaster, if this creep scans and does not register that I have this Beastmaster A clicked, the creep will not aggro to me. And that allows me a, like, one and a half second window to attack the Beastmaster without gaining aggro of that range creep. Yeah. So that, like, if you manage that well, that's kind of how you pull things and all that. And that's, like, why in mid lane, it's a, there's a big battle between, and also in safe lane versus off lane matchups, there's a big battle in maintaining creep aggro and, like, manipulating the creep wave to be in one direction or the other. Um, and that's why if you have to manipulate the aggro, you need to, like, A-click the enemy mid laner and either get it at a good timing for when one of those creeps are scanning, or you need to get it uh, and then, like, hold it down for basically, like, a bit longer until those creeps aggro to you, which right. is very hard to explain, but in practice, if you just, like, go into demo mode, you will notice it very quickly. Okay. I might try that out because... I have to say, like, although I knew about it, I haven't really ever noticed it particularly. Uh, yeah, it's something like if you're not a mid player, it's not that like it's primarily a mid mechanic, but okay. it is super important for safe laners and off laners. Like, um, oh, so a lot of times, like your supports are roaming, so you're just one v oneing. Like, let's say you're playing Juggernaut, the enemy off laner is like a Beastmaster. So if the Beastmaster pulls aggro to be in an advantageous position, they're going to be able to trade with you better because they're going to be able to hit you twice when you're going to only be able to hit them once. Or if they have really mm -hmm. good creep aggro, that means that the creeps have, have established a wall. So if you are going to like gank and spin at this Beastmaster, he's going to see very quickly, oh, he has to go around this little wall of three creeps to spin at me. And it's those very little, small, incremental things that can make the difference in, like, a kill attempt or make the difference in getting two hits over one uh, for uh, for trading and stuff like that. And also, like, uh, so, like, in these offlane Pangolier games that I've been playing, if mm -hmm. I manipulate creep aggro, and they have a really good kill lane, if I manipulate creep aggro, I can pull one creep away from the creep wave to kill that, and it will mean that maybe my creeps stop attacking that creep, which means I can get the last hit, whereas I would have lost the last hit to my creeps. 
or I can pull a single creep back. That way I can at least kill one creep and get that gold. Whereas if I left the creep aggro as is, I would either A, have been killed by their supports uh, in a kill attempt, or B, I would have been uh, been unable to get these creeps because they are in like a point of contention. But if I just pull one away, sure, I can get that. So yeah, it's a, a really, really, really important mechanic to figure out and practice. And there's really no like, no trick to it. it there's a lot of like little tricks to it. Like you can, like you can pull aggro globally. So I can A click a creep in top lane while I'm in mid because even if there's no hero showing mid, the game, the way it's like coded and works, it scans just for am I attacking an enemy hero? So I can manipulate creep yeah. aggro via somebody that is showing in top lane. Um, so little things like that, there are tricks, but mm-hmm. really it is like you just have to like fiddle around with it and practice for a bit. And it, it's very yeah. satisfying to do well. So yeah, that's the patch. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It was, it's nice and short. Uh, how, what do you feel about um, these small updates every two weeks? I li- do you like it so far. I like it. I think it. I I like it, but it is kind of difficult in that it. I've I like I was playing with a couple of people that don't play a lot of Dota um, recently, or like right. people that had come back from long breaks, and there's a weird amount of. Like, there's a weird burden placed on those people that don't play Dota frequently, or at least when they do play Dota, they're super casual and don't read patch notes, in that they used to be yeah. like, right, there's like a big patch, it's like, right, 7.00, big patch, all right. And then all the smaller patches, like, yeah, sure, we can like kind of ignore them, or you like skim them once, but it's like, yeah, this happens every couple months, so you just kind of, you know, look into it. With these t- small two-week patches, mm-hmm. if they are, as this one is, if they're super focused on different roles, it's like, all right... Now every two weeks, I have to explain something new to a friend. Or if I take a week off Dota, that means... If I take a week off Dota, that means I have a week... That means within, like, one week from now, I'm going to have a new patch, and I did not practice the previous patch, so I'm still learning the previous patch when the new patch is coming out. So it's like, you have to just be playing Dota all the time to, like, really understand the changes that these patches make. And then... Like, if you think about it in stages, you have to, A, read the patch notes and learn them. B, you have to play around with the patch notes and see what feels right. And then the third step is you have to see what other people are doing with the patch and what other people have, like, how they have worked around the changes. And then last but not least, you need to implement those changes to your own play. It's like, that's four steps every two weeks that you need to do to activate the patches. Yeah, so it is, it is, that, it is kind of difficult. But super yeah. fun. Like, as somebody that plays fun. a lot of Dota. Yeah. I wonder whether they might eventually drop it down to, like, a patch, like a small patch every month or something. Because every two weeks is a lot. And yeah. you kind of wonder if... Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of things they can tweak, but... I don't know. I just kind of wonder whether they might run out of things to kind of tweak or might just tweak things for the sake of tweaking it because there's a patch mm-hmm. every two weeks. I'm not sure. I guess yeah. we'll just see how, how it goes, but... I think once yeah, a month would maybe. be great. Yeah. I think that's like the happy medium. The mm-hmm. um, I I like that they are, this patch is themed. Like, it's clearly a support patch. I would be yeah. very... Excuse me. I would be very interested to see in future patches if they maintain, like, right... Every two weeks, like, we're going to have a patch, and that patch is going to have a theme to it. Like, this is the rune patch, or this is the support patch, or this is the patch where we buff uh, farming, or this is a patch, patch where we nerf farming. I think that would be an interesting way to kind of, like, make gradual changes to roles and not kind of confuse everybody every two weeks. But who knows? Yeah, that that would be really interesting. That would be very interesting. Okay, so... Uh, before going into some listener questions, uh, let's talk about our sponsor, Unicorn. Uh, Unicorn let's... is everyone's premier esports outlet. Unicorn is completely legal and free to play esports betting everywhere, as well as real money betting if you live in the UK or Australia. You can earn betting tokens as well as Unicorn Gold just to, oh, to use on cosmetic item raffles just by playing your favorite games. In addition to esports betting, Unicorn has plenty of other stellar Dota 2 content, including articles, analysis, guides to new patches, and common esports interest pieces from people like Gorgon and many others. 
Unicorn also has their new Unicorn Connect service, where you can earn Unicorn Gold just by playing Dota 2, CSGO or LOL, and trading gold for chances to win cosmetic items from those games at no cost to you. You can find Unicorn at Unicorn.com and more info on Connect at Unicorn.com forward slash Connect. And that's Unicorn, U-N-I-K-R-N, and Connect, C-O-N-N-E-K-T. Yeah. And I managed to make it through that ad without uh, going into a laughing fit. I don't know whether you listened to uh, last week's Teach Me Tuesday. I did. But, uh, yeah. I, I know <laughs> Pride menaced you. Uh, yeah, with... he was very distracting, and it was also like... 2 a.m. or something and I just I was just in a everything's fun here at 2 a.m. yeah it was I just I was very tired and it was just one of those things where something happens and then you just get the giggles and then even then he wasn't doing anything me just thinking about the fact that he could just chime in at any moment just set me off anyway so so yeah this week definitely I made it through the ad and that feels good (laughs) yeah proud has uh proud has a good way of just like popping a joke on you when you don't expect it at all and it's yeah. it's terrifying uh you know like <laughs> from like a host perspective it's like i need to do this <laughs> yeah. and like but like from a listener perspective that's the ideal i uh yeah doing ads in like a fun way is like a art form one of the one of my yeah. favorite podcasts that i won't name because i don't want them to take away our uh, our listenership uh they <laughs> i tried a few different ways to do ads but one of them was the host was just doing them with like his like seven-year-old son Who's not on the podcast okay. at all? He would yeah. just like have his kid in him and be like, "Oh, you know, today we're talking about like Squarespace, like making websites." And his son would just be like, "I like just like you know, like seven year olds do. They just like talk nonsense." Oh yeah, and it was just like a very cute, endearing way to do ads. Oh, like that is cute. like some some people are really good at like transitions and stuff like that. Luckily, mm-hmm. we don't have like random ads all the time. It's like it's no. hard to do ads if you're like, all right, like this is our comedy podcast. Let's talk about mattresses." Yeah, Whereas, like. Unicorn fits in well, and people know since they're a long-term sponsor. But uh, it's yeah. fascinating to me, from my podcaster perspective, how other podcasts do stuff like that. Yeah, but, that is uh, yeah. that's super interesting. I was gonna say maybe I could like bring my cat in, and then maybe, but then they obviously don't understand what I'm talking about. She'd just meow, and it would be distracting. So that wouldn't be. Yeah, instead of like a child, cats, just though. have just have my cat on the. Actually, she was in last last week's episode yep, as well I just remember. meowing in the in the background that was the inspiration for <laughs> theorograph thursday that is missing on uh the feeds for whatever reason that we're currently trub- troubleshooting oh, yeah. but it's still on the website we're trying to fix that um yeah, yeah go, hopefully go this go show that. went out normally we'll find out um yeah, but we'll see. um uh yeah that that was the inspiration for theorograph thursday being a cat podcast was when i you guys went on like a two-minute tangent about cats after yeah. you cat me out and oh I was yeah like, yep, that's uh <laughs> that sounds about right coincidentally the podcast when... yeah sorry Quinc- i interrupted you no that's fine coincidentally the podcast i was talking about they also have a cat that is like they regularly talk about the podcast it's like one of the hosts cat his name is uh jose and they make fun of him for being very fat oh that sounds like that that sounds great. But yeah, yeah that's what happens person, when you stick but to I'm sure yeah, I was gonna say it's what happens when you stick to two cat people in into a podcast and then one of them meows in the background and actually you're just asking for a cat tangent. It's dangerous, yeah. It's like yeah. yeah. It's it's dangerous, but yeah, it's just our cross to bear. Yes. Okay, so let's do some questions. Um, let's You pick, I don't know. Okay, I'm just gonna Pick one at random. So actually, I'm just going to go from the top. So this is from New Guy, and he asks, when to five man and when to slash should we stop? So, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to do fast answers to these questions today. I'm yeah. not going to draw on and on. So when to five man, you should five man when your team is hitting a power peak or a power spike at the very least. Um, peaks being the most powerful point. And then spikes being powerful points. So you should five man when, let's say, actually, let, let, me, let me pull up one of my games and just do a, a quick example. So you, you're five manning basically when you want to close out a game or establish a large advantage. So in this game that I played with Proud yesterday, I was playing Invoker and he was playing Lifestealer. And we hit a point where I had my Aghanim Scepter, my Aquila, and my Brown Boots. And the Aghanim Scepter obviously is my personal power spike. 
And then Proud had just got his Radiance. So that was his personal power spike. We hit that power spike mm-hmm. around like, I don't know, let's say 24 minutes. Um, actually, probably earlier because I... Uh, yeah, sure. Let's just say 24 minutes. So that was a mm-hmm. spike, and that's when we five manned, and we took two lanes of tier two towers, and we established mm-hmm. map control yeah. that way. Then we stopped five manning once the enemy team hit their power spike when their PA got their BKB, and you kind of go back and forth uh, between power spikes and five manning whenever you are notably stronger than the enemy team. Essentially, if you think you can win a team fight that's when you should be five manning, which is like a huge oversimplification of the process. But that's really like, at the end of the day, that's what it is. Um, oh, I, had a, I had a Ghost Scepter too. That's why I delayed my Ags. Um, okay. I don't want to, I don't want to, oh, I had a Midas, of course, also. I was trying to think, I was like, there's no way I had such a slow Aghanim Scepter without things before. Anyway, that's not important at all. Um, and yeah, so you five man when you are strong and you feel as though you can take objectives and material and the enemy team cannot win in a fight with you five on five um and then you should stop once you have expended all of your ability to win fights so like a to continue that example the reason why we stopped to add a tier two is because they had like a od ult still and we had used our shadow shaman awards already let's say so if we've already used our shadow shaman awards and we've already taken a bunch of like wave clear damage from their underlord and we're kind of low then we have to back off and like you know go farm for a bit go heal and chill a bit maybe get our next round of items and then we five man again whereas if we just kept Mm -hmm. five manning down that lane we would have just fed five heroes to their ability to kill us because they have five full health full mana heroes with ults and we have five people that have already expended most of our ults we've already we're already at low mana stuff like that so that's the gist of when to five man and when to stop it's just about approximating power and then realizing, hey, we're not that powerful, so let's bugger off. I see again, I'm yeah. using English <laughs> phrases just because of like osmosis. <laughs> I, d- I hardly ever say the word bugger there, really. Yeah, well, Americans I definitely mean, every don't now say and it. Then, I don't know. No. Americans definitely don't say it. So I'm going to blame you. I say bloody. I say bloody yeah. fairly, not too regularly, but it does, it does come out every now and then. And that's like a, I don't, a I don't use that British one. thing, I think. No. I yeah, I use a lot of um, weird words just through virtue of my mom is a connoisseur <laughs> of weird words. Like she uses a lot of Yiddish, despite the fact that we're not Jewish at all. Uh, oh, okay. And so I use a lot of like random Yiddish terms just because like that's just Oh, interesting. Yeah, like like uh you're a mensch. A mensch. Like a good person. A mensch? Yeah. Oh, I've never heard that. Yeah, M E N S C H, great scrabble word. Oh. A lot of points. M is three. <laughs> Let's see what's well, three, four, five, uh eight. 14 or 12 points 12 points so solid h's are four it's great yeah i'll i'll uh think of that next time i'm playing scrabble okay so next question uh let's take one from jaris so this is quite a long question but the the gist of it is how do you clear your head when you tilt and will the map allow you to just play safe and off lanes as reversed or do you need to be especially mindful of the lane differences. Okay, so let's uh, let's I'll, I'll do the first question first. So, how do I clear my head yeah. when I tilt? And I'm a very tilty player, um, as mm-hmm. has been established by th- hundreds of hours <laughs> of podcasting. Um, when I tilt, I try to just like get up and like if I'm dead, like if I just feed, I I'm gonna be dead for sixty seconds. I will literally just like get out of my chair and like stretch and take a deep breath and then sit back down. And then, like, refocus myself. Okay. Um, that helps me sometimes. Or, more commonly, the, like, everyday example. I very rarely do that, but that is, like, my last eff- like last-ditch effort to detilt. Is, like, physically yeah. removing myself from the situation. Which is mm-hmm. the way they, like... Anyway. Um, so, the other thing I do is I just mute everybody. Like, even the people that are not t- tilting me, I'll just mute them. Like, if, if, I'm, if I'm getting flamed or if, or if I'm going to flame somebody i'll just mute them so i don't have to deal with them but then if a different person is arguing with the person i've already muted i'll then mute them also because it's, yeah. like, it's like i don't want anything to do with this conflict right now like i'm already tilted i don't need to become more tilted by people talking about stuff that i don't care about so i will just mute anybody and everybody at like the first hint of of tilting me or retilting me 
Yeah, because that, that is super, super annoying. Yeah. It's just about taking yourself out of the situation as best you can, whether that is taking yourself out of the situation by muting them, or like if you are tilted at yourself, which is what happens to me frequently, if you know you're playing bad, that's when you have to just like get up out of your seat, like take a, take a, like go get water while you're dead. Like, I mean, if you, if you died without buyback, you're dead for 112 seconds. Like you don't need to just sit there and agonize over the fact that you fed in a stupid way. Like you can just take a step back. But, all right. That was bad. I need to like recenter myself and then approach the game with a fresh head. So, yeah. Um, don't just disengage mentally from games. That's something that I do that's really bad mm-hmm. um, that I've been reflecting on recently. It mostly happens in Unranked, but, like, I'll play a game and, like, things are just going horribly, and I will, like... I made a joke about it on Twitter, but, like, the other day I was playing a Rubik game, and we actually won this game, but I was super tilted at my team, and I was just having a not fun time. And I literally was all yeah. tabbed in the Steam game section looking at the recent Steam sale, like, finding a new game to buy and play. <laughs> Because I was just so annoyed at my team. I was having so little fun. I was like, I don't want to be here. So I was literally just like skimming through JRPGs, like trying to find something to buy. Yeah. Because I, I was <laughs> like, I was alive at two. It wasn't even like I was dead. Like, oh, really? I was dead you, when I started you were this. Just, just sat. Yeah, I was dead when I started yeah. this. And then I just disengaged completely. I was like, you know, I can, I can save 15 seconds and I'm just going to like, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> So don't do that. Like, don't disengage from the game. Yeah, that, that doesn't. That's not or like great. frequently. I'll. Yeah. But difficult. It's, it's it's tough not to do though. Right? Yeah. Sometimes if there's just so horrible stuff, it's it's hard just to just be. The yeah. Guy. I just don't want to play this. It's anymore. just yeah, because like it's so easy to get tilted, and then just like once you're on tilt, you just get more and more tilted. The worse things get. So you just yeah. gotta like rezone yourself into the right mindset as as easily as possible and obviously sometimes that's impossible like sometimes the game is just going to be miserable and that's just how it is um but Mm -hmm. you don't like don't wallow in your tilt basically (laughs) like try to change something if things are not working for you mentally um that's my advice is don't disengage and try to remove whatever aspects are tilting you um as best you can also, it tilts super hard, like, every once in a while, and that will, like, make everything better. Like, I almost never flame people. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's actually, like, that's terrible advice, but that works for me. Like, I don't tilt. Or rather, I okay. tilt, but I never flame. I, I should say, I tilt frequently, but I don't flame people frequently at all. I very rarely flame people. But when I do flame people, I'll just, like, go in on somebody for, like, 10 minutes in, like, an unranked game or mm-hmm. whatever. And that's a super cathartic experience. And, like, that's why we flame people. Like, everybody flames because it's a cathartic thing. Like, I'm having a bad game. You're having a bad game. So we're just going to, like, argue about it. And that's, like, a obviously a bad thing to do. And it's not a positive thing for the community or whatever. But you can't be expected to be, like, a goody two-shoes all the time. Like, sometimes if you, like, if you just flame somebody super hard and you're like, all right, like, that felt really good. And now I can move on. I'm never going to see that person ever again. And they were a tool also, so it's all, like, even. Um, And that's, like, (laughs) good. Like, I maybe do that, like, once every few months. It's like, I'll just have a terrible game. And I'll just be like, this tusk was literally the worst tusk I've ever seen in my entire life. And this is why. And this is how every single thing he's ever done in his entire life is wrong. And, like, how he should play League of Legends instead. (laughs) And this is why. X, Y, and Z. (laughs) And I, I can't believe that anybody that is in... God, yeah. Like... Do you feel like it kind of builds exactly. up and then there's just this one game and you're like, this is it. This is the time. Like, you're, you're yeah. all going to get it. Like, Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. It's uh, it's terrible. So that uh, that is not necessarily a fourth, okay. spirit, uh, fourth, fourth spirit recommended advice, but that is Ursi recommended advice. Is it? Yeah, I do not condone this, yeah. uh, it, this it, it all, like, depends what kind of person you are. <laughs> like, some people just don't tilt, and I respect mm, that. I'm true. just not that person. Like, I play Dota very seriously, and I find it... I, I so that makes me prone prone more prone to tilt is because like if I'm in a ranked game and some person's not taking it seriously I'm mm-hmm. like what are you doing like you queued for ranked this you are here to be serious that's the only point of this mode and yeah. so that makes me more prone to tilt um, so that's why I've I've had mm-hmm. many years of refining anti tilt strategies um, <laughs> and that's why I don't tilt that much anymore is because like I'm I'm much better at my tilt management. Um, whereas some people are oh, not, good. and those are the people that are getting six month bans and like getting flamed on Reddit, like uh, like Raw Dota, like that dude just got reamed mm-hmm. on Reddit like repeatedly for like days. 
because he did not like shape up his oh, behavior man. and like assess his ability to tilt or not tilt. Um, although apparently he's a. I actually. Go, go for it. Sorry. Okay, I was, I was going to say, I actually said, so in the horrible game I played as Terrorblade, they were just being like really toxic and everyone was like, you need to calm down. He was very angry. And I said, like, have you forgotten about the six month bans? And he did like kind of chill out a little bit after that, but then he just kind of went back. So, um, but yeah, I just wanted to like, it's interesting to remind him of that. And then maybe he was like, oh yeah. yeah. I could get banned for six months and he did turn it down a little bit, but then, yeah, he was still, he just kind of, I obviously forgot about it and like, again, and then just yeah. went really mad. It, there's but, like a certain point of yeah. tilt where it's telling somebody to calm down is effective. And then there's a certain point past that where it's super, super ineffective and makes everything worse. Like if somebody's like a little yeah. tilted, you could be <laughs> like, Hey dude, like, you know, let's just play the game. Um, and then, oh, uh, then they'll like be logical. Cause they're not that tilted. They're at like the beginning stages of tilt. And they're like, all right, yeah, I should come down. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, I should mute that guy. And then there's the point where it's like super late in the game. And it's been like if they've been arguing for 40 minutes, then it's like, all right, hey, dude, you should mute him. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. no, they're not going to mute him. They're just going to be like, yeah, shut up. Like, I'm never muting this person. I'm going to report them and I'm going to like find I'm going to make Smurf accounts and queue into them just so I can report them more. And like it just gets worse and worse. <laughs> so there's a certain point where calm down is effective and a certain point where calm down makes everything worse. Mm speaking from experience yeah i tried the um i think it was it last week when me and proud were talking about the um it's like the everything's okay i believe in my team uh -huh. thing um and i tried that this game oh see i jokingly say that a lot it, it was just it yeah I, okay. yeah like uh so you don't mean it's do you do you do you say it in the hopes that people are going to chill out or do you say it as like are you I being say it sarcastic? as a joke because I think other people realize it's a joke and they'll like laugh and it, it's, it brings a bit of levity like um God was it I think it was yeah. in this Pangolier game I ended up losing horribly yeah it is like a nice lighthearted so thing to like say. we're in draft screen and this dude did was unhappy that he had to play five and so he ended up picking Wind Ranger um which is not a five uh. But he was super tilted, and he was like, oh, yeah. we're going to lose. This is this is so bad. And I was like, dude, calm down. It's fine. I've never lost a game in my entire life. I uh, And so, like, just don't worry about it. It's going to be good. And, like, clearly that's a ridiculous statement that has absolutely – there's absolutely no way I've yeah. never lost a game in my entire life. But it's like a funny, like, morale booster. Be like, oh, you know, don't worry about it. Like, I've – or, like, I've yeah. literally never lost playing Rubik. Like – Okay, sure. I'm sure <laughs> that's not true. Anybody that ever says that, but it's always funny and it's always like a lighthearted thing to say that's like clearly this person is trying to raise morale, but they're doing it in a funny way rather than like a motherly, creepy way. Like I hate it. I hate it when people try to detail being like, Oh, you're all such good players. I'm like, shut up. We're not good players. Yeah. It's like, we're all bad. <laughs> we like stop stop being like this. <laughs> Yeah, so there, there's like there's always productive and, and unproductive ways to to go about things. Yeah, it's interesting. You can never quite tell how yeah. people are going to react to it. It's scary. Um, but but back yeah, to so back to the, the second quest. part of the question. Yeah. But um, back to the question. The second part was: um, Can you reverse safe and offline? Um, so proud proud was um, raising a really good point in the theorcraft thursday vod i believe um maybe it was in the one of the ones that mm -hmm. didn't go through i can't remember but proud was pointing out that the safe lane is only the safe lane until like eight to ten minutes and then it then it becomes like a lane that is super aggroed upon so if i'm playing terrible i can safely farm for probably let's say eight minutes and then at around eight minutes, the enemy yeah. team, their support's probably hitting like level five, their roamer, maybe level six if they're having a really good game. Their offlaner's probably hitting five or six if they've had a decent game. And their mid laner's probably hitting like seven or eight if they're having a good game. So they're going to then focus their attentions on the safe lane. So the safe lane becomes much less uh, safe at that point. And at that point, you are switching your safe mm -hmm. laner to the offlaner. And that's when you are going to coordinate a push on the enemy offlane to a secure your safe laners farm b secure an actual like material advantage in the off lane and uh still uh, and still be farming on, on your safe laner um so that's yeah. a point where you're swapping the safe lane and off lane frequently as the game continues but thinking more structurally about like a from minute zero team comp you generally only switch the safe lane and off lane if you have a really aggressive 
uh, oriented trio of heroes that can aggro try. Like, let's see, what's a good example? So, like, if if I pick Juggernaut and Vengeful Spirit and Spirit Breaker, we can kind of just play an aggressive in the off lane. We can just punch the enemy. We can run at them. We can maybe fight a bit. And then once I'm secured safely, my Spirit Breaker can Spirit Breaker can go roam mid. And then in the safe lane, we can run something greedy like a timber saw, and he'll 1v1 the enemy centaur, and they'll both get farm, and we're just going to accept that their centaur is going to have a fast blink, and then move on, because we'll know our, our timber saw is getting farm. So that is a situation where people will reverse lanes, but if you're running something like that's greedy, like let's say I'm running Spectre and a Dazzle and a Winter Wyvern or some nonsense like that, it's like, all right, we can't aggro. Like, this is not going to work at all. We're going to split XP three ways, not get farm on our Spectre, and we might just die repeatedly. So that's a situation where you definitely cannot swap the lanes. I would very, I would caution people against swapping mm-hmm. lanes in pubs, honestly. Um, it's dangerous, yeah. but it, it is okay. I had one game that like I totally won off of, like it was, a, it was a solo queue game, and some dude was like, hey, I think it'd be a good idea if we aggro tried, and everybody collectively was like, that's a good idea. And then we did it, and it was awesome. But that's like the rare instance. I feel like most of the time it's like, okay, this is a bad idea, and we're gonna lose. Um, yeah, I think like the safer version of that is doing a two-one-two. Like I played a, a game the other day, and yeah. we had a guy who's named Morph, and he only plays Morphling, and he didn't get safe lane. He's like, all right, uh, Rubik, come to the off lane with me. And so we played a two on two and like, sure, it wasn't ideal lanes and it was weirdly aggressive, but it really worked out. And like, we dominated the game. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's kind of like a side or side version. That's like a pseudo lane swap where it's like, all right, we didn't reverse the lanes entirely, but we were, but we swapped around some roles to facilitate two advantageous lane matchups rather than one really good one. Um, So yeah, it's about budgeting kind of in that way. Um, but yeah, the lanes the lanes are very different, so you need to be very aware of like, right? If we if we aggro, we're gonna lose. If they're if they're if they're if they have a safe lane trial lane confirmed, and you know their three heroes, and you know that your three heroes don't be their three heroes, you should not play your three heroes against them. Like that's not gonna work for you. So just don't bother. But be very aware of like what are the matchups, and can I actually win if I do this? Um, and a lot of times that will be a no. And aggro lanes are always harder because they're much more all in. If they go poorly, you're just boned. Yeah. Whereas if a safe lane goes poorly, it's like, all right, that's fine, whatever. Um, it's unfortunate, but it's manageable. Because like if a safe lane goes poorly, there's more mm-hmm. XP due to pulling and due to your supports being gone and stuff. Whereas if you're aggro try, you cannot pull, or you cannot pull easily, I should say. And also you're sp- you're splitting XP three ways. So if you come out of an aggro try that went poorly then you have, like, three level three heroes, and the enemy team has three level four heroes, level five heroes, whatever. Then they just win. So that's something to be very cautious of. I do not frequently run aggro lanes in pubs. Do you do you like aggro lanes? Have you, yeah. have you played much aggro lanes? It's not a thing that a lot of people run outside of, like, coordinated play. Mm, not, not really, no. I, I, yeah, hardly ever. It doesn't seem to really happen that much in... I'm playing a lot um, yeah. by myself. Um, I, th- I think I it used to happen when I was playing more in stacks, but um, yeah, like the stack I used to play with a lot of all now still just they just play <laughs> PUBG all the time. So, so, uh, so I'm like I'm playing a lot solo more recently, and um, yeah, it doesn't seem it doesn't really seem to happen that much. Yeah, I, I see it very rarely. Usually, it loses because it, it's like one of those things that requires coordination, and in a pub, you probably don't have coordination. So yeah. Right, do yeah. You... yeah, pubs are very uncoordinated. Yeah, which is probably a good thing in terms of you can abuse enemy uncoordination, but sometimes it, it'd be nice if there was a bit more coordination mm-hmm. on your team. Uh, do you want to do one more quick question? I'll, I'll actually be quick this sure. time. Sure, do you have one that you want to uh, do? Mm. <laughs> yeah, like how you said, we'll, be, we'll do quick answers. Okay, I'll, um, I'll do one from Sauce, because <laughs> I, I read the word Rubik, and I was like, all right, I can't avoid a Rubik question. Sauce asks... Could you please explain when to buy Yule's Scepter on a support? Ursi mentioned he bought it on Rubik every now and again, but when I'm playing, I always feel like a Glimmer Cape or Four Step is far superior. I can never work out if it is a Yule's game or not. 
Um, let me let me see. Actually, if I pull up my Rubik, um, my Rubik match history. Uh, uh, let's see. When was the last time I bought a Yules on Rubik? I my Rubik history is kind of a mess because I just kind of build nonsense all the time just for fun. Uh, like the other, like I mean, if you look at my Rubik match history, like my last game, I built phase boots and a drum and an aether lens. There's another game where like I built an armlet and a buckler. Uh, so this is a bit of a no, months. All right, here's a game a month ago where oh, I built yeah. a Yules, uh, and actually there's a bunch of Yules games after that. Yules, so like Yules, the big reason why I buy it in games on supports are if I need to dodge something. That's going to be big. Or I, if I need to purge something, that's going to be big. Or if I need to lock down an enemy in like a way that provides for my allies to set up. So in this game, yeah. in this game where I build Yules, I was against a Skyrath Mage. So that's a big purge that I need to, uh, I need to avoid. And also a core Skyrath. So I can Yules myself to dodge his E-Blade. I can Yules myself to dodge his projectiles. And I can obviously, like I said, Yules to purge the silence. But then the bigger thing was mm -hmm. they had a Kunkka, and you can Yules to dodge Kunkka combo. And this was a core Kunkka, so I didn't really need to oh, do that. Oh, yeah. But if you're going to get Kunkka comboed, like, you should just Yules yourself and avoid it. And if the Kunkka is really good, he will just Kunkka, he will hold his combo and then assume you're going to Yules and then do it on top of you. But if that's and done, then, then you yeah. just got outplayed and you're just boned. Um... So, yeah, that's, like, a really good example, right, is there are multiple things I need to dodge, purge, or delay. Um, delaying as a mechanic is very dangerous, but it is very high value in the right situation. Uh, in another game, mm -hmm. let's see, like, people sometimes buy Yules just to, if you, um, let's see, I bought a Yules in this game, and the enemy team had a Slark. Right, so if Slark has dust, then he's going to jump me, and it doesn't matter if I have a Glimmer Cape, he's just going to kill me. Um, but if I have a Yules, then that means I have 2.5 seconds where I'm up in the air and my teammates can come and react, and his Shadow Dance is, like, winding down. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, like, these kind of little things. Um, also, yeah. Sorry, my, like, voice is going for some reason. Um, oh. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I just had a look ones. on. Uh, I just I was had I just had a look at Dota buff, and apparently Rubik's that build yules have a fifty six percent win rate. It's it's a great item. It's just kind of like uh yeah. like uh like Sauce pointed out, it is an item that a lot of times there's a better alternative. I almost never build yules first. Mm -hmm. Yules is usually like a second item. Like in this game, right. Let me see my build. I believe I built it after Glimmer. Um, I hope I don't disprove myself um, right here. Let's see. <laughs> so in this game, I built Mana Boots, Glimmer, Blink, and then I built a Yules. Um, this is an old game. I probably would have built an Aether Lens before Glimmer and before Blink and before Yules. But anyway, the Yules is like a good second or third pickup on supports when you need it in games like this. Whereas the first item, you want to have something more concrete, uh, like utility, more standard, like a Glimmer Cape. Um, or a Blink or a Force if you need mobility. Yules is much more suited to that, like, second or third. Like, all right, it's a good item, but it is not, like, a game-changing item for anybody. Like, delaying is not going to change the state of the game. It's just going to delay so that you do what you're already doing better. So, uh, in general, it's not an item I build first. As an example of a game where I built it first, mm -hmm. just to pull this up. Um, let's see, in this game, I built it. I didn't get until 40 minutes, which you can tell how that game must have been going. Um, <laughs> I built it first because, let's see, it's always hard to look at old games and think, all right, how, how did I think about this process? I yeah. believe I built it first because I was just getting initiated on by a quap and she was just orchiding me and killing me. So I was like, right, I can literally build nothing that is going to prevent this from happening because she does physical damage, pure damage, and I'm silenced. So if I build a glimmer cape, she deals enough damage instantly with purge or with pure damage from ult and uh, and uh, and physical damage from clicks that I'm dead anyway. Um, and then I, if I build a ghost scepter, I won't take physical damage, sure, but I will still take everything else. 
And so the only solution was I just need to be up in the air for two and a half seconds. So I did that in that game. Also, they had a CK. So if you have good reaction time, CK jumps you. And then you can, when the reality rift is coming out, you can fly yourself up with the Yules mm. and dodge it. Dodge it. And of course, yeah, you're going to die right yeah. away when you come down. But that buys two yeah. and a half seconds for your, tier, for your team to react. So I got a Terrorblade on my team this game. So that bought two and a half seconds for Terrorblade to use Reflection. And it bought time for my Clinks or my Nyx to set up stuns and stuff. So yeah, a lot of times just yeah. keep in mind, like, if I delay, will my situation get better? If yes, then maybe Yules is the right choice. Mm. Yeah, Yules is, Yules is a great item. I don't build it too much, but when I do... Yeah, I enjoy it a lot. <laughs> I go through phases with items. Like I'm just looking at my Rubik mm-hmm. history, and like there's a clear like month period where I was super into Yules, and I was building it in like maybe half my games. But oh, I haven't yeah. I haven't built a Yules in like in almost a month. Actually, my last game was a month ago oh, where okay. I built a Yules. But in that yeah. month, I built like eight Yuleses. Um, so I'm a bit of a trend based player, like personal trend. Yeah. Like now, I just build Aether ones all the time. So like that's my personal trend that's going on. So, mm-hmm. yeah, but yours is definitely good. It is, uh, just keep in mind that, like, it's not a first item, barring very, very uh, specific situations. Yeah. It can game change, though. Like, it's an amazing item. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, so that's that's my official okay, answer. Okay, great. Yeah, okay, cool. So uh, let's wrap this up. So just before I do plugs, I want to give a quick shout-out to, um, we reached out by a listener of the podcast who's doing a, a Dota study. Uh, him and another student is, uh, they're doing their master's and they're both psychology students at a stu- uh, university in Sweden. And they're looking for people to participate in their study. Um, it's all about personality traits and uh, working memory and the links between those and what makes you successful in Dota, which could be really interesting. So if you want to participate and help them out, go to wwwdota 2 study.com and you can read about it on there and yeah apparently it only takes about half an hour to do it so yeah if you want to check if you want to check that out go ahead and help out yeah some fellow listeners and the long part is the second part uh i did the first part in like three minutes and i believe they're like yeah. submitted separately so like you could just do the first part and it's like three minutes or whatever uh so yeah oh, it, that's it, was, cool. it was fun it's interesting all these yeah, kind of studies I haven't got are always, to... always a good time I didn't do the full yeah. thing, but I did the first half. So I'll, I'll get around to the second part eventually. Yeah, me too. I haven't done it yet, but I, I definitely will do. It's cool. It's okay, nice to have so, academics involved in video games. Yeah, I, it sounds like a really interesting study. I'd be interested to see what happens with it and what, what comes out of it. Hopefully something good. Um, yeah. Yeah, hopefully something that will help yeah, me all play a better. Bit MMR. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so you can follow us over at Fourth Spirit um, on Twitter. You can follow Ursi at Ursinity. You can follow me at A at B Dub. Um, you can support us on Patreon if you wish to do so. And another great way to support us is to tell a friend about the podcast. Yeah, um, a friend or six. That's uh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It doesn't just multiple. have to be one. You can tell multiple friends. <laughs> yeah, it's not like it's not like tickets to like a fancy dinner. Where, right, I only have a plus one. It's like no, you have infinite yeah. pluses. You have plus mm-hmm. and then the little infinity symbol. Uh, yeah, tell the, everyone yeah. about us. Also on Patreon, you get the casual shows on Mondays. Every other Monday, there's a casual show, and then every other Monday, that's not a casual show, is the hero specific episodes where you can learn about stuff mm-hmm. like Terrorblade from this week, which I need to watch yeah. or listen to rather. I think I need to listen to it again, uh, based <laughs> yeah. on my last Reinforce. my last game. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, if you aren't part of our Discord already, you should check us out over there, which is discord.gg/forth, and send us a question if you want us, uh, us to answer a question on the show. Email us at show at forthspirit dot com, or just send a message over to one of the hosts, and we'll make sure to add it to the list. And Yeah, thanks so much for listening and goodbye, everyone. Bye.